when you are. All right. Thanks, Kelsey, for the introduction and thank all of you for joining us this evening. Uh, it'll take me just a minute here and we'll get my slides pulled up through the uh, screen function here. So bear with us just a minute. All right. So Kelsey, you should all be seeing my slides there. The, the introductory slide, is that coming through okay for you guys? Yes, it's there. All right, thank you. Well, once again, I, I certainly appreciate the opportunity to visit with all of you this evening about your upcoming beef projects. Some of you are probably in the process of looking for those calves right now. And so tonight we're gonna focus a, a little bit on how to feed those 4-H uh, market beef projects. Uh, There we go. Now that should have advanced to the next slide. So we're going to spend a little bit of time this evening uh, talking about some nutrition basics. Uh, but however, we're going to spend the bulk of our time really talking about feed selection and then feeding your project. And I put a couple of bullet points down there below feeding your project of a couple of common question areas that often come up or that I get asked by parents of about holding animals uh, for a particular show or, or how you can help keep those animals on feed at the show and what are some strategies that you can use to do that a little bit better. Uh, you'll notice I, I did really make the font a little bit bigger on these feed selection and feeding your projects on this slide on purpose. I think that is something that's, that's very important because essentially, you know, how you feed your project is just as important as what you feed and what you feed and how you feed it is, is really what drives the genetics and, and all of those things that you've purchased in those, those projects. So they all go hand in hand and, and really come together uh, as well. So it's just, a, you know, selecting a good project and, and one that's gonna make a good market animal and, and feeding those animals, those all things all go hand in hand as, as far as I'm concerned. Now, one of the disclaimers that I do want to make this evening is I do have a few pictures and a few mentions of some trade names in this presentation this evening. That's by no means an endorsement. Those are just some pictures to, to kind of liven up the presentation or, or maybe some products that you might see on a feed tag in particular. So please keep that in mind as, as we're going through there that that is in no way an endorsement uh, by K-State or myself. So you know, from a simplistic standpoint, what makes a cow different from a pig? Obviously, uh, a cow is a ruminant animal and a pig is a monogastric, right? And so those are some of the things you've probably talked about maybe in your basic project meetings. Cattle have microbes that live in their rumen. Uh, those, those microbes essentially uh, are bugs that are going to digest the the forage and the, then we actually have different types of microbes. So there's a microbial population that's going to digest grain. And then there's a microbial population that's predominantly going to work on the forage component of the diet. And that's really one of the things that makes ruminant animals and cattle really unique is that they have the ability to do that. And that's, that's very important because, you know, they're one of the few species out there that can convert you know, grass and forages and cellulosic biomass into usable high quality protein. So in terms of a superpower, you know, the, an animal that can convert grass into steak, well, that's, that's a pretty, pretty amazing superpower in terms of, of what cattle can do for us and in terms of feeding the world. So if we look at the ruminant digestive tract, and we talked about them being a ruminant, they, so they do have a four part species. And so that rumen sets right up here, you can see it here. And so the mouth and the esophagus, and then that food would go into the, into this reticulum, the rumen, the omasum, and then the, the abomasum. And so that rumen is where that microbial population is, is going to reside and where they live. And really some interesting facts about the rumen is that it really represents in some cases, 24 to 48 hours worth of feed. So there's feed in that rumen that could have that animal could have consumed 48 hours uh, prior and even longer in some situations, depending on the diet. So think of that as just really as a big mixing vat where, where we can mix some of those, those feed stuffs all kind of come together and those microbes begin to, to work and digest that forage. And then uh, so those, those microbes are a really important part of uh, feeding and taking care of our 4-H market beef projects. So in terms of cattle requirements, and we think about the things that cattle need in their diet. So we could talk about uh, protein. Obviously, that's one that, that often people will, will focus on in terms of purchasing a, uh, 
a, a particular feed for their, their project, but there's more to that feed than just protein, right? Protein, we're all familiar with essential amino acids. In the case of ruminants, many of those amino acids are going to come from the rumen microbial population. Now that's different than some of our other species. We also have energy, which isn't necessarily a nutrient, but it's a property of nutrients, right? Or properties of feedstuffs. And so energy typically comes in, the, in two forms. So carbohydrates and lipids. So lipids would be fats, right? And carbohydrates would be the grains, starches, and sugars, et cetera. Vitamins, we think about A, D, E, and K. Uh, the B vitamins are going to be produced by the rumen microbial population. And then we get into the minerals. So in terms of macro minerals, these are the ones that are required in larger percents of the diet. Those are going to be things like sodium chloride, so salt, right? Calcium phosphorus for bone growth. You guys are probably very familiar with that. Magnesium, sulfur, and potassium. Then we have the micro minerals or the trace minerals, as we often call them, because they're required in the diets in smaller amounts. So those would be copper, zinc, selenium, cobalt, iron, manganese, and iodine. And lastly, we can't you know, forget about water, the importance of water. And then there's some other things that cattle would require in terms of the diet of linoleic and linolenic acid as well. So those are the essential components of what cattle would require from the nutrients they consume in their feed. And so that's what we're trying to provide to these animals with our, with our feeding programs, essentially. Now, oftentimes we spend a lot of time focused on protein and energy, a little bit of time on vitamins and some time on minerals. And so they often get lost kind of in the shuffle of things and, and water, that one gets overlooked quite a bit as well. So we'll spend some time on all of those. Now, as we think about feed selection, Okay, some important characteristics of the feed for your, your animals. So feed should be most importantly fresh, very palatable, consistently mixed and supply all of those essential nutrients that we talked about in the previous slide. Okay, so you know, what is palatable? What does that look like to a, to a calf? Well, something that they're going to wanna eat. And if you think about that, you know, what's your favorite breakfast cereal that you would eat? Is it, are you really a fan of just plain old cornflakes or would you rather have something else mixed in there? And so if you think about breakfast cereal, that's a pretty good comparison, you know. Would you wanna eat dry cereal or would you rather put, wanna put a little bit of milk with that to, to get it, um, to soften that up a little bit and make it a little bit more palatable, right? So both commercially available feeds as well as custom mix rations can meet all of those characteristics. If we think about, you know, providing fresh feed, whether that comes in a bag, uh, from a, you know, a commercial type feed or whether that's something that you mix on farm, those can easily, all those criteria can easily be fulfilled in both of those scenarios. So let's talk about, you know, what I call custom or, or maybe mix at home rations. And so cloth custom blends, one of the biggest reasons that we might want to do that for our beef feeding project is that those feed stuffs are often going to be more economical than a bagged ration that's that's come that's commercially produced. If we think about the costs associated with with uh, you know the bagging, the advertising, and all those things, et cetera, oftentimes our custom or mix at home type rations, the primary reason we may want to do that just is mostly due to cost. Okay, there are some challenges though. Uh, mixing your ret feed at home or going through a custom mill. Um, that can be challenging, right? Especially if we consider that uh, the amount of feed that you're going to have to produce on a daily basis if you're trying to mix that at home by hand in a bucket or using something like a cement mixer or an old food mixer to be able to pull that off. It's certainly doable, but it can be a challenge. Uh, if we think about getting a custom ration made at a feed mill, and that's very common, commonly done, one of the limitations here is that the minimum order for most feed yard or most feed mills, excuse me, is going to be somewhere around 1,000 to 2,000 pounds. And in some cases, it may be as much as 3,000 pounds that you'd have to order at one time uh, to be able to get that feed made. And so those minimum orders can present a challenge, especially if you only have one or two animals on feed. Now, if you're going to go the route of trying to mix a ration at home, and I think there's a lot that can be learned uh, in a project by doing that, you do need to work with your county agent or maybe your project leader or even a feed manufacturer or a nutritionist like myself to make sure that you're developing a, a balanced ration for those cattle because that's that's something that uh, is takes a little bit of skill to be able to do and oftentimes there's even some computer uh, ration balancing software that can help us do that very easily. <clears throat> 
So the advice that I would give someone that's, that's doing a custom or a mix at home ration is you want to keep your rations simple. Rations do not have to have seven or eight different ingredients. We simply need an energy source. We need a source of protein and then something to take care of the, of, of the mineral and vitamin needs of those animals. So a lot of times we're looking at a very basic ration that can consist of cracked corn, maybe some rolled milo, soybean meal, dried distillers grains, maybe some wheat mids or some other, you know, high fiber type uh, products would come to that as well. We can use something like molasses to improve the palatability of that, as well as bind any of the fines. Obviously, there's some differences between cracked corn and dried distillers grains. And cracked corn is fairly coarse. Dried distillers grains is going to be very fine. And so we've got to do something to, to aggregate and make those different feed components stick together. And then we need to have some sort of a mineral and vitamin package. And that can come in many different forms. We can have a loose um, mineral package where it just looks like a granular mineral like we typically put out for a set of cattle out on grass, or it may even be a pelleted form of mineral that you can add uh, at a rate of, at a predetermined rate of maybe one to two pounds per head per day in that particular mix. So keeping those rations simple, they don't have to certainly be complex. They can have as few as three to four ingredients. And in fact, I've seen foragers be very successful with their market beef projects on some very, very simple rations. Uh, we've talked a little bit about the freshness of the feed, and, and oftentimes if you're going to mix up a batch of feed, I'd recommend that you don't really mix more than about a two to three week supply. Uh, really, you could stretch that out to a month if you had to, but we need to keep that feed as fresh as possible because that's certainly going to lend itself to that feed being more palatable. Uh, so that can certainly be a concern if you've only got one or two animals that, that you've got on feed, which is very common, right? Now let's talk a little bit about commercial or bag feed. Okay, so first out of the gate, brand doesn't matter. You can have a very, you know, name brand uh, type show feed, or you can have a show feed that's just made simply by a, a little local mill. Both can be very, very good feeds. You know, it comes back to checking those things that we've we've talked about before. Is that feed palatable? You know, is it a balanced uh, nutrient profile for those calves? Can they mix, mix the feed consistently? Most importantly, can it be economical? I mean, a lot of times that's an important consideration, especially as we get into some of the higher end show feeds that are out there. They're very costly in turn, on a price per bag basis. And I will say that I do think there are some, some smaller commercial mills that do produce some very good show feeds that are basically on par and very competitive um, with those commercial feeds that are out there. What it really comes down to is make sure that you know what you are buying. And the way that you can do that is you have to be able to read and understand that feed tag. There's so much information on a feed tag. And oftentimes, many people don't take the time to really look at their feed tag. And that's really what we can utilize to compare, you know, feed A to feed B. If we're making that decision between the two, and maybe want to make an accurate comparison to compare them on price or, or whatever criteria that we may want to establish. So if you think about a feed tag right up the top, we're always gonna have the brand and product name that's listed. And there is specific things on a feed tag that, that we are required by law to put on that feed label. So every feed tag should have the same basic information essentially. So you'll have a brand and product name. You also have a purpose statement. You know, Is this a, a feed stuff that's designed to be fed to feedlot cattle? Is it a finishing ration? Is it a show calf grower ration? There'll be some sort of statement that tells you what this feed is going to be made for. You may see a medicated claim, and we'll talk a little bit more about what this means. But basically, that just says that this feed does have a, a medication in it. It does have a feed additive in it that would fall into a specific category that would warrant it being labeled as a medicated feed. Then we'll have the guaranteed analysis. This is going to be, you know, what is the chemical composition of this feed? This is where you can really start to make that apples to apples comparison between two different feeds that you may be looking at. So you'll see crude protein, crude fat, as well as calcium, phosphorus, and some of the base information here that's going to tell you what's in that, that feed. So it really just tells us that chemical composition. Really the two, the three important things we're going to is protein, the fat content, and often crude fiber, what's going to help us make those decisions between those different feedstuffs that are out there. And down at the bottom, you'll see the ingredient statement. 
Uh, this tells us what the feed is made of. You know, what are they actually utilizing to make this feed? You can see that this one does have some urea in it. Uh, it also gives you the different forms of the minerals that may be used in it as well. And then at the bottom, one of the most important pieces of information that's there is the feeding directions. This gives you an estimate of, of where you might wanna feed this, this ration, what the target intakes will be. And you'll see some will have very little information here, which is listed here. Some will even have you know, very specific feeding directions in terms of how many pounds to feed a particular class of animal that you may be, be feeding. So always read and, and take a look at those um, feed labels, especially as you're trying to make those decisions and comparing some commercial feeds that might be out there. And I said we talk a little bit about that medicated feed or that medicated claim statement and what that means. Typically in cattle feeds, what that medicated claim is going to be is that that feed contains a product called an ionophore. These are going to are compounds that are going to be added to the ration in grams per ton, so it's a very small amount. And essentially, all these products are is they're antimicrobials that work directly on the rumen microbes within that rumen, and they select for more efficient microbes. And so what that's going to do, it's going to increase the intake of the animal, which increases performance and the total amount of energy and calories that they're going to consume per day. Now, here's where we've got some of those different products that that might be. Some of you are probably more familiar or may have heard of the term rumensin. Well, the ionophore, or this, the technical name for that is menensin. We have products like Bovitec, which is lasalacid. Another one, the common one that's out there is GainPro. Uh, so just a few of the difference, but that's really most often in terms of our show feeds that, that we're, you all are going to be dealing with. It's typically going to be an ionophore is, is what's going to be the reason for that medicated claim uh, on that particular uh, feed bag. So some tips when purchasing commercial feeds. As the crude fiber increases, the amount of energy in the diet decreases. So as we see that fiber fraction or that fiber number go up, that means that there is going to be less energy in that particular feed stuff. Now, as the fat content increases, typically the energy increases. And uh, typically we think of feeds that have more fat, at least in the human world, higher fat equals higher energy, right? And most of the rations that you guys will encounter will typically contain 12 to 16% crude protein. Now, there will be some differences between a grower feed as well as a finishing feed, but that's the typical range that you would expect to see as we think about show cattle rations or commercial uh, bag feeds that might be out there to feed to a market beef project. So as you get into making your ration choices, most commercial feeds will offer different types of feeds, and they tend to fall in three kind of broad categories. We have starter feeds, grower feeds, and finisher rations. You know, those starter rations are going to be those feeds that when those calves are relatively small. I would say typically somewhere in the range of five to 600 pounds. These are typically feeds that are going to be used for a short period of time to get those animals accustomed to the feed. That next step is really a grower ration, which is may have a bit more energy into it, may still have a, a higher fiber fraction, and it will typically have a higher crude protein content than our finisher rations. And this is what we're going to be able to use, going to use, utilize to grow those animals, typically up to about 800 pounds. So it's not uncommon for a steer or heifer to spend a large portion of, of the time that they're on feed on some sort of a grower ration and then you know a lesser amount of time on a finisher ration. It really depends on personal preference here, but that's some of the differences there. Those finisher rations are typically going to be that last step. I think of those as being utilized later on as that animal really gets ready for that show that's coming up and we wanna put that final bloom on a lot of those animals. Typically the last hundred or so days on feed is when we would utilize those uh, different types of feeds that are out there. We certainly uh, wouldn't wanna start an animal necessarily on one of the finisher rations. We might wanna use that grower ration and allow those animals to grow just a little bit. So kind of using the right product in the right place. So as we look at some of the differences, and, and I did mention these a little bit earlier, so this is just an example of a grower and a finishing ration here down on the table. So grower and starter rations typically contain less energy, and they're going to have more crude protein. So you can see here the crude protein numbers, 14% in a typical grower ration. It's not uncommon to see those values go as high as 16%. And the finishing rations, typically 12 to 14% would be kind of the norm. Uh, crude fat content, very similar between these two examples, and crude fiber, 
we can see here that the maximum is 14 and a half percent in the grower ration. So if you were paying attention earlier when I said is that fiber fraction goes up, what does that do to the energy? It certainly goes down, right? And crude fiber here is be a maximum of a little over 10 and a half, 10 percent in that finishing ration that, that's here. So in terms of the next step, so we've got through selecting your feed, whether that's a commercial or a mix at home ration, or even a commercial bag feed that might be available, and moving into how you feed your project. So for me, one of the most important pieces of equipment that's often overlooked in any 4-H livestock project that's out there, regardless of whether it's a pig or a goat, uh, is a scale. And around our house, and, and I do have uh, some daughters that are involved in 4-H, you know, I like to say a scale is essential. If you don't measure it, you're just guessing because you don't know. And so scales, this is the one that, that I recommend. Uh, this is one that we utilize in, in our program at home. Uh, they're, they're fairly durable. They can be battery powered, so they're pretty easy. They also can be plugged into the wall. They're also pretty cost effective. They come in different capacities. For most purposes that are going to be out there, a um, 150 pound um, capacity scale is going to be more than adequate. You know, if you're thinking about it, that's what you're going to put that feed bucket or that feed tub on. And so they, they tend to work pretty well for that, especially where we're going to be feeding 25 to 30 pounds uh, for a typical market animal. So this is just an example. There are several others that are out there. Um, this is just one that I know works fairly well and has been very reliable uh, for us and at home and even use them in research settings here at, here at K-State as well. So we can't underscore the value of fresh and a fresh and clean supply of water. And oftentimes water gets overlooked. You know, it's really easy to not think about cleaning out the water tank, especially if you, you get your new calf, he comes home, and a lot of times they're drinking out of the same water tank that the animals were last year. And so it's always a good idea to at least every so often to go in, clean those water tanks out. If you've got it set up where you can do it daily, that's great. Um, <clears throat> we often do, really don't realize that, you know, if we've got really poor quality water, what's that going to do to feed intake? And so if you reduce water intake or you've got poor quality water, that's certainly going to impact that animal's ability to, to consume feed, especially if they're going to be consuming a fairly dry ration, which most of our feeds that we're going to be feeding in this situation are typically going to be on the drier side of, of what we would feed to cattle. So let's spend some time talking about feed intake because feed intake really is what's going to drive that energy density in terms of that calf performance. And so really what determines feed intake to some extent is going to be the calf weight. And then what's your performance expectation? How much gain do you really need out of that calf? And so, you know, this is something that you need to take in, into consideration. So oftentimes we have a target show that may be the 4-H County Fair that's in July. It may be the Kansas Junior Livestock Show, right? Well, what's the optimum market weight for your animal? <clears throat> On a lot of times for a steer, you know, we're talking about market weights that are going to be somewhere in the neighborhood of 1,400 pounds, right? On a heifer, they may be slightly lighter, somewhere in the neighborhood of 1,300 pounds. So if we take that 1,400-pound steer and we say it currently weighs 800 pounds, Let's say we've got to gain 600 pounds, so 14 minus 8 is 600, and we've got 200 days to do that. That means that steer needs to gain approximately 3 pounds per day to meet that target. So always give some consideration of, you know, how much performance do you need is really determined by what endpoint do you want to have that animal at, and when is your show date. So typically ad libitum, or the maximum intake, or full feed, is going to be somewhere in the neighborhood of two to 3% of body weight on a dry basis. And that's pretty important here. That's a dry basis. That's not as fed or in the bunk is how I like to say it. So generally two and a half to 2.8% of body weight is when we consider that calf or the, and that steer or that heifer to be on full feed. And so here's some good guidelines to give you an, an idea of what that looks like of different uh, animals of different weights. And yes, I put I put steer up here. So that could be steer or heifers. And I just use two and a half percent of body weight. Here's a guide because that's kind of the, the bottom end of what we would expect to see for an animal that's on full feed. So if we have an 800 pound calf, 
which might represent that calf after he's been at your house for a few weeks. And we've got him up to two and a half percent of body weight. So that's 20 pounds of feed on a dry basis. If we consider that most of our feed and hay that we're going to feed to a steer or heifer is going to be around 90% dry or have about 10% moisture in it. That means that their actual as-fed feed here is going to be just a little over 22 pounds. So that as-fed feed amount is always going to be greater than the dry feed amount because we're adding the water back to it. So if we go up to a thousand pound animal at two and a half percent of body weight, that's easy math, right? 25 pounds of dry intake or about 27 or 20, 27, almost 28 pounds as we get that in the bunk. Now, if we go all the way up to that 1400 pound steer, if they're consuming two and a half percent of their body weight, that's 35 pounds of feed on a dry basis per day, or almost 39 pounds uh, of feed is what they're going to be consuming, consuming on a daily basis. And so one of the easy guides to know whether you're on track with your steer or heifer project as you go through the year is to simply do a little bit math. If you know they're a little bit of math, if you know their current weight and how much feed they're consuming, which is why the scale is a really good way to be able to tell that, we can tell exactly in terms of the percent of body weight of where those cattle are at. And if you're trying to achieve and maximize those gains and make sure that those, those steers or heifers are on target to reach that market endpoint weight, and they're only consuming about 1.8 or 2% of their body weight, you're probably going to be a little bit behind as you get closer to that, to that show date. So that's always an important benchmark you know, as you step your calves up on feed is to know how much is a percent of body weight that those cattle are actually consuming. That's one of the best benchmarks to know whether you're on track with that steer or heifer project. So in terms of feeding your project, one of the most important things you always have to keep in the back of your mind is to be consistent. Uh, you know, every day, you know, doing the same things and doing it at the same time of day, that's very important. Cattle and animals and livestock generally like consistency. Okay. One of the things you want to have is to have your feeding plan in place before you buy, before you purchase that animal, right? I mean, oftentimes it's really easy to go to that sale and you may not have, you know, your feed purchased. And so you're really kind of scrambling a bit to get that in place. The other thing that's really important this year, especially with drier conditions, is that you want to have a good source of moderate quality hay uh, as well before you get that project. Now, oftentimes, 4-Hers and 4-H families think, well, I, wanted, I need that to be in small squares. And, and I would say that's often not the case. We can make 4 by 4s or those large bales if you've got the capability of handling those. Um, they can certainly work just as well. It certainly doesn't have to be small square bales of, of really high quality hay. It can really moderate quality hay for our market animals is going to work just fine. Uh, in terms of those four by fours, you can flake those off. They do need to be stored inside, but you want to have that especially locked down so that you're not making a change as you go through your feeding program. So if you have the ability to get enough hay to get you through your project, that's always best because then you won't have to make a change midstream. Now you can certainly do that. It just creates another variable that's out there. As we come back to that number one rule, we want to try to be as consistent as possible with these projects. So develop and maintain a feeding schedule. Okay, one of the things that often comes up is how often do I need to feed my animals? I like to feed twice a day, 7 a.m. and 7 p.m. Those are pretty easy times to maintain, especially if we think about a show environment or our normal schedules with school. Um, the other thing that often comes up is, you know, there's going to, we know there's going to be that instance where we miss a feeding. You know, someone gets sick or there's a basketball game or out of town. And so one of the things I wanted to put here in big red letters is don't double up if a feeding is missed. If you happen to miss feeding your animal, Try to get out there and feed it as close to the time that you would have as possible. If it's closer to that next feeding, so say you should have fed your animal at seven o'clock in the morning and it's two or three o'clock, you might want to just go ahead and feed just a little bit early and miss that additional feeding and, and just skip that one and move on to the next one. You certainly don't want to double up that feeding. Uh, as we get into the warmer uh, months of the year, Cattle will often eat during the cooler times of the day. So often feeding earlier in the morning can be beneficial. 
Uh, cattle will tend to shift their intake patterns. And so it's not uncommon if we, for those cattle, if we put feed out there and it's, it's already 10 o'clock, they may not get too excited about getting up to the bunk and or up to that feed pan and cleaning up that feed until it starts to cool off a little bit. So, so always keep that in mind that you may want to shift those times a little bit, uh, either go earlier in the morning or feeding after it gets dark in the evening. So that's kind of the one exception, but whatever your feeding schedule is, just make sure you're, you're relatively consistent in when you feed those, those cattle. So I wanna talk a little bit about roughage and rumen health and why that's an important component. We've talked a little bit about concentrates in those bag feeds. We can't underscore the value of having some roughage or hay in the diet. We've gotta have that to maintain a healthy rumen. Now, essentially the fermentation of starch or grain, that's going to create acid in that rumen. And so when we feed roughage, those cattle have got to chew that roughage a little bit more, eructate that, and that's going to increase saliva, which actually buffers the acid that's produced by that starch or grain that's in that feed that we're feeding. And so that's one of the reasons we always want to have a small amount of roughage or hay to those cattle, typically 10 to 20% of the total diet. Now, oftentimes, you know, it's, it's tempting if we're just feeding hay to, to fork some off of the bale uh, or to feed one or two flakes of hay to those, those steers or heifers that are in the pen. What I would recommend is that you put that hay in a large tub and weigh it. Uh, and if you can do that each and every day, you're going to be a lot more consistent. And think about that 10 to 20 percent. So if you've got that animal consuming 25 pounds of, of feed in total, what does 10% roughage look like, okay? So keep some of those numbers in, just handy in the back of your mind. It's really not that hard to have a separate tub for your hay. Have that by the scale and weigh up the next hay's, the next feeding of hay that morning so it's always ready and, and there to go for you. So you can put that hay in a large tub and, and weigh it on those scales if you wanna track the amount of hay that you're feeding fairly easily. So in terms of starting our cattle on the grain or feed, it's always a good idea when those, we first get those calves to start them on some moderate to, to, real, to pretty high quality hay. Now, I don't, I'm not talking necessarily about alfalfa here, uh, but maybe just some high quality uh, grass hay uh, or even teff grass is very common and irrigated grass hay out here in Western Kansas would, would be very good in terms of starting those calves off on feed. You're gonna continue feeding a little bit of hay until that desired grain intake is achieved. I'll often start by offering just three to four pounds of that grain per day. And then we steadily increase that about a half to a pound every three to four days. So oftentimes it's gonna take us three to four weeks, maybe even a little bit longer to reach our desired intake level uh, on those growing animals. Cause we do wanna keep that 10 to 20% hay, maybe more during that grower phase on those animals that we're bringing up on feed. So if we're starting cattle on our cattle go off feed, how do we handle that? That's, that's going to happen. Uh, so the first step is to clean out and discard any of that old feed. That doesn't mean you have to necessarily throw it away. If you've got some other calves around, or even if, if mom or dad has a cow herd, that can be a great place to put some of that feed that those calves didn't clean up. But you wanna clean that out because first of all, we wanna keep our feed in front of these show calves as fresh as possible. Okay, so typically what I recommend is that we decrease the amount of grain to the previous amount the calf was consuming prior to the most recent increase in intake. So that means if we're feeding those calves 12 pounds of, of grain, that if they do go off feed for some reason, what we might want to do is take a step back. And if we we're feeding them maybe 11 pounds prior to that, go back to that 11 pounds per head per day, drop that feed just a little bit maybe offer a little bit more hay and try to reset those animals and get them started on feed. Now, one of some tips that I would give you is going slow is okay. Um, it, you know, most cases with our show cattle, we've got plenty of time for them to reach that target weight. And so going slow up front is going to allow you to go fast later. Getting them started is, is really important here and how we get them started. Typically what causes cattle to go off feed, a big one is going to be weather. The second one is usually comes down to human error. You know, misfeeding times or not taking the time to weigh out our feed uh, for those animals. We're in a hurry. We just fill the bucket half full. We actually inadvertently fed those animals maybe a couple more pounds of grain than what we've been doing the day before. And oftentimes they'll let us know that that was maybe more feed than they were used to eating. So, you know, going slow is okay. And it's okay to make mistakes, right? 
So in terms of feeding steers and heifers and, and how to use a grower ration versus that finisher ration, we generally feed a grower ration until about seven to 900 pounds. We're trying to get a lower rate of gain on these animals. We certainly don't wanna to put too much condition on them too early, right? We wanna allow them to grow that bone and muscle that's genetically there. We do wanna get some fat deposition and make sure we have enough energy in those animals to do that. But typically we're looking at growing those animals up to about, I would say 900 pounds on a steer, maybe seven to 800 pounds on a heifer, just because those heifers are going to reach that market endpoint just a little bit earlier. So 100 to 150 days before the target market show, that's where really what we want to start to switch those animals over to that finishing diet. Here we're after a higher rate of gain, typically in excess of two and a half pounds per day. So a lot of times we're really targeting about a two and a half to three pound per day average daily gain. We're gonna keep maintaining all that bone and as well as that muscle uh, deposition that we've, we've attempted to put on those animals through that growing period. But really our goal in this finishing period is we're starting to add condition onto those animals. And so to do that, we have to provide energy above and beyond what the, that animal's maintenance requirement is. And because once we go above the maintenance level, that's where we're really gonna start to see fat deposition and get into those animals that are going to grade choice and prime, which is really what we're after in this case in terms of these market animals. So two common problems that I guess I, I often see is that steers are not finished and tend to lack condition. Heifers tend to be often over conditioned. And so if we think about that, why are those steers not finished? Well, typically they're at lighter weights or we didn't feed them enough to get enough energy into it. Now on the heifer side of things, heifers, as I stated earlier, they tend to reach that market readiness point a little bit earlier. And so it's really easy, often easier to get those heifers to where they have too much fat deposition. And so always remember that fat deposition and condition is the product of excess energy consumption. So especially on the steers, we want to make sure we've got plenty of intake. We want to increase the energy content of the diet by feeding those finishing rations. We may even in some instances want to take those, those really large frame steer calves and maybe put them on a finishing ration a little bit earlier in the feeding period. Now each animal is going to be a little bit different. It also depends on you know, when that target show is and what that target weight is for those animals. So there's a lot of variables there. But, you know, just keep in the back of your mind that one of the biggest things we often see is that heifers tend to become over conditioned and get a little bit too fat for a lot of our sh our shows, especially county fairs and steers just often aren't quite market ready. They may be a little bit lightweighted and may lightweight and may lack some condition. And so as you're building your feeding program. So I said I'd talk a little bit about a couple of common questions that come up. And, and one of those is, you know, how do we hold cattle for a particular show? If we've got a steer, you know, we want to show him later on in the year, but he just seems like he's, he's growing too fast. He's putting on too much condition uh, 36 day, 30 to 60 days prior to a target show. Um, what do we do about that? And so first thing I want to say is holding animals, especially growing animals back, it's very difficult. Um, you know, it, it, there is science and art involved in that. And, you know, uh, quite honestly, sometimes it's easier than others. And there's some animals that, you know, no matter what we do, they're still pretty aggressive eaters and they, they're still going to gain weight. And so one of the things we can do to hold some, some cattle, some steers or heifers back, if they are getting a little bit too much condition on them too early, is we can limit their feed intake really to that, I said below here in the slide, but it really should be back you know, to that maintenance requirement um, is where we want to target. If we go below those maintenance energy requirements, what's going to happen to the animal? They're going to lose too much condition. They're going to start to lose muscle mass. So we want to restrict their intake, but we don't want to restrict it such that those cattle start to go backwards and start to give up some of that condition. So really what we're trying to do when we hold an animal is we want to maintain that condition, but limit the additional weight gain. And so really what we're trying to do here is reducing that excess energy consumption or target the amount of energy that we're providing that animal to where instead of gaining three pounds per head per day, that maybe they're gaining two and a half pounds per day. 
Okay. And so we can do that by utilizing a strategy called limit feeding. And this is where we reduce the total intake as needed of both the hay and the grain. We, so we're essentially reducing the caloric intake of those animals by reducing that feed intake. Uh, we, want to in, we may also want to increase the number of feedings because as we reduce that, the, the intake or the amount of feed that we're delivering to those steers or heifers, what's going to happen? Well, they're going to be hungry during the day. And so maybe to keep them happier, we might want to add a third feeding, maybe at lunchtime that we go out there and offer a little bit more feed to those animals. Kind of spread that feed throughout the day just a little bit is a really good strategy to keep those animals happier uh, and kind of keep them on feed as well as to maintain a happier rumen environment. Uh, in this instance, I, I do recommend that you pull back both the hay and the grain. You'll see some recommendations where, there, where they will increase the hay uh, and, and replace some hay with grain. And that is an option that's out there. However, as, as we increase that hay, we can start to really change and dilute out the, the energy of that ration. And so uh, it can, both strategies are acceptable. It's just typically if we reduce the total intake of both that hay and grain back to, to a predetermined level, um, that's a little easier for us to manage. And then we can always add more uh, hay back to that if we need to, uh, to kind of keep those, those animals if they go off feed or anything like that. So how do we need to feed our animals at the show? Because oftentimes it's a stressful environment. We know those animals are going to go off feed. And so it can be a good idea to maybe pull those animals uh, back a little bit in terms of the amount of feed they're feeding. So if you were feeding 30 pounds at home, maybe pull that back by a pound or two um, a day prior to that show, just simply to keep those animals just a little bit more aggressive uh, and a little bit hungry as they go to sh the show. The other thing we talked about feeding schedules of that 7 a.m. and 7 p.m. If possible, if you can maintain that same feeding schedule while at the show, I think that's a really good idea to help keep those animals on feed. If you need some additional fill on those animals, you can use hay or even some other roughage sources that might be out there. One of the things we have to be careful about if we are trying to add fill to those animals, what we really don't want to do is drop three to four or even more pounds of that overall finished feed back into those rations because that's going to really upset that ruminal balance, especially an animal that may be stressed as well. Uh, in terms of keeping animals on feed at the show, this is one of the areas where there are some supplements that can be fed uh, that I do think have some benefits in terms of direct fed microbials. There's a lot of different products that are out there. There's products like Probias and there's many, many others that are available out there that, and you'll find several products that are out there. Really what this does is this helps to maintain a more stable, stable room and environment for those animals and really can, can offset any of those stress responses that those animals might be experiencing. So in summary, in terms of feeding, feed selection, as well as feeding your projects that you might have, hey, okay, you want to just overall select a diet that's fresh and palatable. Is it something that those cattle are, are going to want to eat? And then is the feed that you're feeding, is it fairly consistent? And most rations are going to be balanced if you've worked with the nutritionist with your customer, your mix at home type ration. Uh, but you want to make sure that each and every day you're providing that animal the same ration, that same hay that's, in, in, that's been in front of them for the previous week if possible, right? We've talked a lot about consistency. To me, that's one of the most important things. I didn't count how many times I said the word consistency in our presentation tonight, but it was probably a lot. Uh, so we also want to make any of our diet changes fairly gradually. So if you do have to make a change, um, you know, it's okay to go slow, right? Uh, so if we've got to make a change in terms of the type of feed that we're feeding or we want to switch products, maybe midstream, just make sure you have enough feed on hand to, to make those changes gradually over a period of seven to 10 days. You always want to feed some roughage. Uh, you will see some feeds out there that are advertised as a complete feed. Uh, I would argue, yes, they may have adequate fiber to do that, but still putting a little bit of coarse roughage and, and hay in front of those calves is always going to be in it, um, beneficial for you. Um, intake is very important. We talked about, you know, one of the big guidelines to know how you're on track with your project is how much of a percentage of their body weight are they currently consuming. And that two and a half percent on a dry basis is a pretty good benchmark to know that you've got that animal uh, on full feed. 
And so their dietary intake is directly going to relate to how much energy they consume. And that's what's going to drive fat deposition and weight gain, as well as the amount of condition that's on those steers or heifers at the time we get them to the show. And so most importantly with your projects, make sure you have fun. Um, you never know uh, how far your steer or heifer project can take you. At once upon a time, I was a Kansas 4-H'er uh, and you know, showed steers and heifers, uh, usually five or six per year, uh, went on to graduate school. And, and what you'll see here is uh, this is uh, a student worker myself preparing some animals uh, to go into a metabolism facility during my PhD program. And, we got the opportunity to break a little over 50 head of, of steers uh, to lead in the period of about six months. And so those skills that you learn as a 4-H'er, you can put them to use later. You may not know where you're gonna utilize them down the road. So have fun with your project. You may not know how far it'll carry you today. You just may find something that you uh, get really excited about and end up being a cattle nutritionist when you grow up. And so with that, I'll open the floor for any questions and we can put those in the chat box and I'll, I'll try to repeat those for everybody as, as they come through. Uh, the last thing I will say is that uh, I will put my contact information up here and, and Kelsey will share that as well, hopefully with all of you. Uh, if you have questions about uh, the nutrition or your projects or you wanna make a comparison between a couple of different feeding programs, uh, uh, my email as well as my phone lines are always open for you guys anytime that you want to uh, give us a call. We'd certainly be happy to address any of those questions that you might have. So with that, I'll uh, kind of stop sharing my screen here and go back to a view where I can see most of you in the, in the chat box as well. Wonderful. And thank you, Dr. Wagner. And as he is doing that, if you guys have questions, I'd invite you to go ahead and put them in the chat. We'll go ahead and repeat them uh, for everyone to hear and get some questions answered for you. If there are things that you think of after the fact, be sure to email Dr. Wagner. Um, I do know that he worked with uh, some Barber County 4-Hers and probably some other counties as well to put together some feed rations for their market beef projects. And so uh, if you've got questions, this is, this is a great time to ask and a great resource um, for you that we have available through K-State Research and Extension. We know that most of you are probably either in the process of purchasing your projects for this year or you have already purchased them. Um, and weigh-ins are typically early uh, spring, late winter, um, depending on how you look at that. And know that uh, now's a good time to get started. I would reiterate that uh, it's a good idea to have an idea of where you're starting. Um, so have an idea of what your calves weigh. Um, and we can, and you can go from there. So, so far, no questions. Uh, we'll give you guys a few more minutes to enter those into the chat. And if not, you are welcome to log off too. Once again, this will be, re this has been recorded and it will be posted on the Kansas 4-H Animal Science webinar page on the Kansas 4-H site. That link will be emailed out to you all tomorrow morning uh, so that you can go, go back and rewatch. And then we would also ask that you share uh, some feedback with us so that we can better serve you. Addison is asking, is there a guide available for the percent of fat and protein in the feed with respect for the steer's weight and the time till the show? Yeah, so that's a good question, Addison. And so no, there's there's really not a, a good guide that, that I could give you because one of the big determinants of that is going to be, you know, what is that target rate of gain for that steer? You know, like we said, you know, if we gave that example between the steer or the heifer that you're going to show at the county fair versus one that you want to show at a later show, you know, you may, if you've got more days, you're going to be lower energy content um, to reduce, you may not need as much energy in that ration to the gain. Now, in terms of protein, there's some okay benchmarks that we could maybe give you here. So typically on a finishing ration, the total dietary crude protein content that I would be looking at needs to really be about a minimum of 12 to 13%, okay, in terms of total diet. 
As we get into those growing phases and those younger animals, their requirements tend to be a little bit higher. And so we tend to think about that as being 14 to 16% crude protein. But really the fat uh, content, as well as the, the, the energy density, that's really gonna be a function of how much performance you need out of those animals, which is a function of what they currently weigh and what you want them to weigh at the end of your project. Great question, thanks Addison. Additional questions? Okay. I think we're going to go ahead and wrap it up for this evening. Once again, uh, I will email, I'll, I'll email you uh, Dr. Wagner's uh, contact information when I email the link for the recording uh, tomorrow morning. And so if you have additional questions, I would encourage you to reach out to him. Uh, if you happen to lose his contact information, you are welcome to reach out to me as well, and I can get you in contact with him. Um, once again, thank you, Dr. Wagner, for sharing with us this evening. Thanks to all of you for joining. Uh, we will not have an animal science webinar in December, so enjoy the holidays with your family. Uh, but we will be getting back together at the fourth Monday in January, and we will announce the topic closer to that date. So with that, thanks again, and have a happy holidays. Thanks, Kelsey. Thank you.